Welcome everyone to the Middle Tennessee State University uh, University Honors College Spring Lecture Series on Climate Change. Today the lecture will be titled A Biblical Approach to Climate Change and it will be given by the Honors College's um, own Dean John Vile. Everyone knows Dr. Vile. He is a professor of political science here at MTSU. Uh, he chaired the MTSU Political Science Department before becoming Dean at the Honors College in 2008. He is a graduate of William and Mary and the University of Virginia. And he's a recipient of MTSU's Outstanding Career Achievement Award and the American Mock Trial Association's Congressman Neil Smith Award for Law-Related Education. He has written and edited so many books, including multiple encyclopedia on great American lawyers and judges, the First and Fourth Amendments, civil rights and liberties in America, the U.S. Constitutional Convention of 1787, the American flag, the Liberty Bell, uh, and the National Anthem, and his upcoming next volume will be on the Bible in American law and politics. And he's therefore the perfect one to speak to us today about climate change, a biblical perspective. Dean Vile. Thank you. <clears throat> it is a pleasure to be here today, even though we don't have the normal or usual audience. I hope those of you who are watching uh, by satellite or whatever means you're using or taking good care of yourselves. Uh, if you have any problems during the time when MTSU classes are out, I hope that you will feel free to contact us. We are still in the offices, most of us. Uh, and I have included my email here. Uh, if you have any particular problems that you're not able to solve, uh, let us know because we want, we want to get through uh, this particular situation. Now, you'll notice as we go to the first slide, which mostly has the title on it, that I've purposely titled this A Biblical View of Climate Change rather than The Biblical View, because frankly, to my knowledge, I mean, there are some climate changes that take place in the Bible, but to my knowledge, the Bible directs, us, directs itself to the subject only indirectly, only by looking at various biblical principles, and certainly, you know, Christianism is divided, uh, as Jewish thought is, into number, uh, numerous denominations, and some are going to stress one verse or one particular way of viewing things over another. My own view is a Protestant Christian uh, perspective, but as I'm sure you know, I'm not here to convince you of any particular biblical interpretation or impose any kind of, uh, any kind of religious view on you but rather to give you what I believe to be would be sort of the consensus view both among, I believe, Catholics and most Protestant uh, denominations. And as was mentioned uh, by Dr. Evans, this book comes in, or this lecture comes in part uh, out of a book that I have just completed. It's going to be published, I believe, in, uh, in August uh, by well, who is it by? <laughs> Going to be published in August by Roman and Littlefield, uh, not my usual publisher. Uh, it's going to be published in August on uh, the Bible in American Law and Politics. One of 300 or so entries in that book deals with climate change, so I used that and then did some extra uh, research uh, for uh, today's uh, talk. So, I've already made, I guess, the first point that there's not necessarily a single view. There are undoubtedly, uh, just as there are multiple denominations, there would be multiple views. Uh, but I think you could, we can certainly identify some views as being biblical uh, and others not. And in preparing this lecture, it brought me back to my undergraduate days when, at least in the group that I was with, one of the individuals that we read a lot of his works and thought a lot about was a guy named Francis Schaeffer. Uh, it's hard not to like a guy who in the latter half of the 20th century was still dressing like founding fathers. And perhaps because I myself have sometimes dressed as James Madison, I have a particular affinity for him, although I don't think I would have the same capacity to grow a beard uh, that he did. But nonetheless, that's how he typically looked. Uh, wrote numerous books, and when I was an undergraduate back in 1970, uh, he wrote a book entitled 
uh, pollution and the death of man. And to my knowledge, it was one of the first written, at least by an evangelical Christian, that seriously grappled with the issue of what Christians should do with regard to pollution. I went back and reread the book, and one of the fascinating things about it is, I, to my knowledge, there's not a single reference in there to climate change. There were a lot of references to hazardous waste dumps. There were probably some references to air pollution and smog and the like. But my understanding is, at that time, I guess 50 years ago, climate change was not on the scientific radar in the same way that it is today. So his book doesn't specifically address climate change, but much of what he says certainly would apply to the approach that I'm going to take uh, today. One of the points that he made, and that I have heard other Christians make, and I believe it to be the case, is that Christianity, although as we will discuss in a moment, is sometimes seen as being in conflict with science, is, is in fact not. Uh, and that in fact, there are many who have examined the birth of modern natural science and have concluded that it would be largely impossible had it not been for a Christian worldview, uh, or I guess I should say a Judeo-Christian uh, worldview, since uh, the principles that I'm going to apply would be taken from, from both of those and probably would apply to many uh, Muslim uh, interpretations as well. But the argument is that in Christianity, the world was viewed as God's creation. Now, it wasn't, as we'll discuss in a minute, it wasn't identified with God. Uh, Christians don't hold the pantheistic view. But the view was God created the world, uh, and the world was good, as we'll discuss in a moment. And as a result of that, the world was an object of legitimate inquiry and observation. Uh, many of the early scientists, and I have one of the more distinguished ones there, uh, Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, he was one of three men whose pictures uh, were side by side at Jefferson's, Mr. Jefferson's Monticello in Virginia. Um, he had a very a deep interest in, uh, in the Bible and spiritual things. Uh, and in fact, he wrote probably more about biblical prophecy or as much about it as he did about natural science. Um, other people have argued, many of you know that probably the greatest uh, teaching of Christianity is that God became flesh and dwelt uh, among people uh, in, in the form of Jesus Christ. And many people take that as being a sign that human flesh is not in and of itself uh, somehow less than what it ought to be. Uh, there are some, you know, there are some religions that seem to see, you know, hum separate the spiritual and the physical, but Christianity, as I understand it, the Bible as I understand it, teaches that human beings and all of creation are made uh, by God and that we can, in fact, enhance our understanding of God by studying creation. Uh, there are many biblical passages that suggest that one of the means of knowing God is by realizing that he is the creator uh, and sustainer uh, of the universe. When you look at the universe, you see majesty, uh, you see infinity, uh, you see great variety. And all of these give us an insight, perhaps, into the mind <clears throat> uh, of God. Now, historically, particularly in early 20th century America, it is not unusual to see those in the scientific community sometimes pitted, or those, I guess I should say, in the biblical community, sometimes pitted against those in uh, the scientific community. Much of this arises out of the theory of evolution, uh, which of course was developed in the late 19th century by Charles Darwin. And many of you know it reached a climax in Tennessee in the Scopes so-called monkey trial of 1925. Uh, you may you probably remember or know that Tennessee had passed a law prohibiting the teaching of evolution in the classroom. Uh, a school teacher by the name of Scopes uh, had challenged this law, and two of the nation's leading advocates sort of lined up on opposite sides. Clarence Darrow, who was something of an agnostic, uh, 
basically you know, thought the whole law was nonsensical. And William Jennings Bryan, the great commoner who had won and lost three times for the US presidency, uh, took the side of Tennessee. And although Tennessee technically won, uh, the law, uh, the fine against Scopes, uh, there was a fine against Scopes that was thrown out through a technicality. Many people thought the fundamentalists came in uh, Christian fundamentalist biblical view came in sort of on the short end of this uh, and many many Christians sort of withdrew or fundamentalist Christians at least sort of withdrew from the political realm uh, they began developing their own Bible colleges and seminaries uh, and the like but if I can say a kind word on behalf of William Jennings Bryan who is sometimes portrayed as something of a buffoon uh, first, of course, he was a very talented politician, but one thing that is sometimes left out of the story is that Bryan was less concerned about the scientific teaching of Darwinism than he was about the sociological teaching of something known as social Darwinism. Social Darwinism was the theory that attempted to apply naturalistic science to humankind and it used the principle of survival of the fittest. So if you were a social Darwinist uh, and you saw that there was a famine somewhere, you could easily say, well, that's God's way of weeding out those who are unfit. Or, and in fact, social Darwinism, some people think, was at least in part the basis of Nazi ideology. We're going to develop a super race by weeding out those uh, who are unfit. Uh, and even some leading Americans, people like Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the, the great justice on the Supreme Court, express notions akin to social Darwinism, which are clearly opposed to the biblical notion of taking care, as we will discuss in a little bit, taking care of the most needy. But it does still set up at least a stereotype that Christians and people who follow the Bible must somehow be opposed uh, to natural science. And I must tell you that uh, another sort of feature out there is that sometimes when you, you know, sometimes we choose sides by who's on a side. And a lot of times you'll see Hollywood celebrities step forward and, you know, they're, they're going to go without meat for a week or, or, or some such in order to prevent global warming. And I think people of the book look at that and say, well, if they're on that side, maybe we need to be on the other. My own view is that, you know, that people of goodwill, uh, people who are knowledgeable here uh, can line up uh, on, 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 on together on, on this issue. Uh, but if you read and at the end of this, I'm going to give you a little bibliography. And there's a book by Robin Vilman uh, called The Gospel of Climate Skepticism that examines why it is sometimes perceived that Christians as a group, uh, people who believe the Bible as a group, are, are opposed to dealing with uh, uh, climate change. That's certainly not my own view. Um, now, there is a Christian view uh, or a biblical view that I think needs to be discussed. Sometimes you will hear people say, I am just a pilgrim passing through. Uh, that's a long time biblical analogy. It goes at least to, back to the New Testament. It's in Augustine one of the greatest works of Protestant literature, of course, is the Pilgrim's Progress. And so some people say, as a Christian, as a believer in the Bible, uh, I am a member of the heavenly city. I'm just passing through for this city, so what do I care? Or maybe better yet, Bible tends to suggest that, God, that Christ could come again at any time. The world will come to an end, at least as we know it. And so why worry about it? Uh, and I will, among my friends, it's not uncommon for people to tell me, I think maybe this is a sign of the last, some people actually view climate change as a sign of the last times. Uh, you know, we're not going to live to worry about it, so why bother? Now that is a view that you can take out of Christians, uh, out of the Bible, but there are a couple reasons that I'm going to give you for suggesting that's not a very good way to approach climate change. Uh, the first is the Bible clearly teaches that Christians nor anyone else know the day or the hour that Christ is coming back. Uh, Jesus himself says that, as Son of God says, he doesn't know. 
If Jesus doesn't know, probably there's a good chance that I don't know or you don't know. Uh, now, you will sometimes, if you get a real literalist, they'll quibble and say, well, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can identify the year or the decade or the century or whatever. And somebody's eventually going to get it right if the, Bible's, you know, if the Bible comes to pass and Christ comes again. Somebody will be able to say, well, I told you so. Uh, I said it was going to be tomorrow, and it was. But if you go back in Christian history, we don't have a very good record of predicting. There are a lot of very pious, thoughtful people who got it wrong. Uh, back at the turn of the first millennium, and through the next 200 years, there were all kinds of movements that swept over Europe saying that the world was coming to an end. There was one gentleman in particular, jo Joachim of Fiori, who was predicting that the imminent return was there, uh, and of course, didn't happen. In American history, we've had similar movements. Probably the most notable of these occurred when a pastor by the name of William Miller in the 1840s uh, began carefully examining the books of Daniel and a couple other biblical prophecies. And he finally, if I recall correctly, narrowed the date. I don't remember if he gave the specific day of the, day of the year, but he narrowed the initial date down to 1843. And there's a little cartoon that talks a little bit about it. I love the cartoon. Uh, this, I don't think, was as prominent as we read back into it. But there were people who would sell their possessions and gather on hilltops, literally waiting for Christ to return. And what I like about the cartoon is, you know, apparently we wear white robes in heaven, at least that's the theory, and it's sort of nice if you come prepared and have your white robe already there so you don't need to do a change of clothes uh, when you get there. But in any case, you know, that's what, almost 200 years ago, uh, 175 years or so, that this happened, uh, and people are still making predictions. There was one, I believe, in 19, either 1980 or one year, He'd say, well, you know, 80 reasons Christ has to return in 1980. And the next year he wrote 81, years, 81 reasons why he has to return the next year. Uh, so we haven't had a very good record. Jesus sort of warns us against making predictions. And as a counter-authority, I'm going to cite a verse that I think is probably the most applicable to this case. And that's a passage from Jeremiah 29, 4 through 7. Jeremiah, as many of you know, was one of the major prophets in the, in the Old Testament, Hebrew Scriptures. That means he probably got tenure because he wrote longer books. The minor prophets just wrote short things and they probably didn't get tenure. But Jeremiah, faced, Jeremiah had prophesied that the nation of Israel, the people were going to be carried away into captivity in Babylon. And when they got there, people began to ask, okay, Jeremiah, you were right, what should we do? And a lot of them said, well, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep my bags packed, sort of like we did it when we were in Egypt. We're going to get ready to leave so that we'll, be, you know, we'll get out of here as soon as we can. And Jeremiah, presumably after listening to God, was told, no, you're going to be there. I can't remember if it was 70 years or longer. But you're going to be there for quite a long time. And he said, under these circumstances... Seek the peace of the city, whither I have called you to be carried away, captives. Pray unto the Lord for it, for in the peace thereof ye shall have peace. So he's telling Jews who are aliens in a strange land where they don't worship Jehovah, uh, where they don't have a temple, where the priests probably have limited, if any, functions, may or may not be able to carry on their daily sacrifices. He's telling them, you're part of this civilization now, you need to work for their betterment. You should do whatever you can to make the people of God, you know, fit in uh, in a way that will benefit your neighbors. When you do leave, you know, may it not be because they despise you, but because it's time for you to go. And I think that's, you know, given that we don't know uh, the time or the season, uh, and given that it could be that many of us will live out our natural lives, and maybe even our great-grandchildren will do so. Certainly, we should be as committed to solving ecological problems as any other group of individuals 
uh, might be. Now, I like to refer to this scholar uh, because unlike me, I'm just a political scientist, if I recall, I believe she is actually a geoscientist, perhaps even a climatologist. She's pretty well known. Uh, you might just, if you're, if you're home and have a little bit of extra time, uh, can hang out at the Honors College like you usually do. I would suggest that you look up some of her uh, sites online, and it may even be that Dr. Phillips uh, is going to use one of these a little bit later in this series. But in any event, she goes around, she's an evangelical Christian, she's married to uh, a pastor, and they, by the way, have written a fairly good book on the subject, which I'll put in the bibliography at the end. But she says that she constantly visits churches and she's asked, do you believe in climate change? And her answer, from my perspective, is a very good one. No. I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I rely on God. If you're asking me, do I think, as a scientist, do you think climate change is occurring? Yes, she's come to the conclusion that climate change is here. It's having an effect, and we should do what we can. And then I'm going to put that here with, a, with another view. Now, I mean no disrespect for anyone. Uh, people can believe what they want. Um, but one way of combating climate change is to convince people that the earth is our mother. And therefore, you know, we have to worship our mother. We have to take better care of our mother than we are. And you will find in Christian history, you will find some people like Francis Assisi who will occasionally refer to the earth metaphorically, I believe, as either a mother or a sister or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that, but from the Christian perspective, we worship God. We don't worship the earth. The earth is God's creation. But though we don't worship it, there's still plenty of good reasons for trying to take care of it. Now, I'm going to give you some principles that I believe are biblically based. Uh, as a Protestant, I would caution you, don't take my word for it. I'm going to give you some scriptures to back up each of these. But as the Bible says, search the scriptures. Uh, I'm not presenting my view as the definitive view at all. But I do want to give you a little bit of perspective on this. One of the most fascinating things about discussing creation and the Christian obligation to creation is to go back to one of the earliest Christian philosophers, St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo. Uh, he was bishop about the time that the Roman Empire was falling, the, the barbarians were coming in, uh, and he wrote, as many of you know, an extended book called The City of God, trying to explain uh, how God could permit this to happen, and sort of refuting the argument that it had happened because Rome had turned to Christianity. But one of the most fascinating things about St. Augustine is when he went back and he read the ancient Hebrew text, particularly Genesis, he came up with a theory that we call creation ex nihilo. Now, ex nihilo, remember uh, the, Christian, uh, the, the Christian elite, particularly in this day, the elite all over the world, spoke either Latin or Greek. And this is a, is a, is a Latin phrase, which you can probably figure out. It basically means when Augustine read Genesis 1, he read it to say that God simply spoke the world into existence. Everything that we can see, whether it's the earth or the moon or the stars, all of creation was spoken out by the word of God. God created it out of nothing. And when you think about it, that's, that sounds counterintuitive. You, we can't make anything out of nothing, right? Um, but many people believe that the modern science is sort of caught up with this view because the most prominent view that I know today of creation is the Big Bang Theory. Now, you know, we don't have Augustine, so we can't ask him. If you had asked Augustine, well, what about converting energy into matter or vice versa, he may or may not have known what we were talking about, but the Big Bang Theory, as I understand it, is basically that creation did occur at a particular time and place, much as the Bible suggests when in Genesis 1 it says, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, one of the significant things, people will often say, 
Well, you know, the creation account in the Bible, uh, you need to compare it to other accounts of its day. And I actually believe they're right. And one of the things that you'll find that is significant is that in the biblical account, Genesis 1 makes it very clear that God is not the Son. That was the belief of many people in Egypt. Uh, God is not the moon. God is not the whole universe. Uh, they are separate from God. We don't, as Christians or as Jews or as Muslims, we do not worship the moon or the stars. They are God's creation. They're separate from, different from God. Uh, God is not everything, if you will, is in the presence of God, is subject to God, but God is not in things in the sense that you can, you know, the, the, this desk is not God. This chair is not God in the Christian view. They're separate from Him. And, sad as it is, I'm not God either. Nor are you. Human beings are made in the image of God, which means I think that we have many of the personality characteristics. We have the ability to love, the ability to think, and whatever, but we are not God. And this I, I actually didn't borrow it from the book, but I remember from uh, Francis Schaeffer's books that he, one of the illustrations he loved to use was this scene from the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Michelangelo's greatest, uh, one of his greatest masterpieces on the creation of man. And if you look closely, you will see that, God, that there is a distance between the finger of God, who of course is a spirit, and is, this is a, a, an allegorical depiction of God, but there's a, there's a distance between God's finger and Adam's. Adam is not God. He is in the image of God, but he is a separate creation. So, and by the way, if you're in the image of God, then you would have certain responsibilities. You would have certain gifts, including the gift of intellect, uh, that presumably as problems come along, uh, you can help uh, solve them. Now, what do we know about creation as it's described in the Bible? There's a lot of controversy about it. I've had some of the biggest controversies of my life with fellow Christians who say the only, the only way you can interpret Genesis is one day is a single, is, is a day. And I've had others, my own view is every day is an epic. There's a scriptural justification, by the way, in Psalms, which says something to the effect that with God every day, every day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as a day. And I think you can get too literal about that too. It's just saying God is above time, beyond time. Uh, his calendar is not our, my calendar. So I'm not really going to, I am not a young earth creationist, but I'm not here to argue with anybody who is or isn't, except to say that what we do know from Scripture, if you read the very first chapter of Genesis, Genesis means beginning, you will see on various days, whether they're days or epics or eras or however you describe them, God would create something, and I think I can go back to my notes here. I like to do it as little as I can, but let me try it. Um, so, Genesis 1.10. This is the time that God is supposed, to, God separated the dry land from the sea. And he does it, and he says, this is good. And then again in verse 12, he creates the plants, and he says, this is good. Looks green. Uh, verse 18, he separates the night from the day. This is good. Now people know how to go to, know when they should go to bed. Uh, 25, he creates the animals. And then when he gets all the way through, I'm sorry, yeah, the last one, when he gets all the way through, he's, right, verse 31, he says, it's very good. So the scriptural view, as I understand it, is God created uh, a, a perfect world. Now, that being said, there's also the account of creation is followed very quickly by an account that we generally call the fall of man. And again, there is tremendous variation in views among all three monotheistic religions 
about how exactly to interpret uh, the events in the Garden of Eden. Are they literal? Are they allegorical? Frankly, for purposes of this lecture, it doesn't particular ma particularly matter because there's no interpretation that you can come to, as far as I can see, other than man is flawed. M humans are flawed, I guess I should say. Uh, humans are not living the good life that they were intended to live in the Garden of Eden, nor are they living the life that they are intended to live either in a millennial reign of Christ on earth or in heaven. Uh, I wore, you know, all of you maybe know, I wear special ties for most of my occasions. Uh, I have one that one of my staff members found for me not too long ago. Has a picture of a lion uh, sitting beside a lamp, both looking very contented. Uh, this is one of my favorite painters, Edward Hicks. Uh, my wife, who's in the audience today, did a story, uh, did a paper on this, if I remember, when we were undergraduates together. But he would draw these pictures called the Peaceable Kingdom. Uh, and they would feature, you know, children playing with uh, snakes or with wild animals and everything being peaceful. And he further uh, painted a picture. If you look there in the background, that's supposed to be William Penn. Uh, nicely negotiating with the Native Americans and everything is at peace. Well, as a matter of fact, we know that that was not the reality through much of American history. But uh, human, what we were supposed to be in the Garden of Eden and what we will one day, we hope, become in paradise has been marred. And I thought there's so many images that we could use for this. And I want to be very careful to say, you know, not everybody who burns coal uh, is necessarily a sinner because they do so. But we certainly know from our own experience that when we extract minerals from the earth and when we burn them, they can have untoward consequences. And just as there are responsible people who do this, there are irresponsible. So this is a picture and I don't remember whether it's supposed to be, I believe it's supposed to be from Kentucky, but it's possible that it's West Virginia. But you have these verdant forests here prior to mining and then the results after mining. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be this way, but it's a reminder that sometimes human greed, uh, human avariciousness uh, can lead to dire uh, results. Now, Let's go to another, what I believe is a biblical principle. And that is that human beings should care for the earth as they would from any, for any other gift of God. Now, here's where you will sometimes see accusations against uh, certain views uh, expounded by Christianity. And I can't say that we have never been guilty of these, but I will say that I don't think it's a proper interpretation. So. If you look at Genesis 1, uh, verse 28, and I'm not for sure that I have written it out, so if I haven't, you may have to, uh, you may have to call that up on the net and, and find the specific reference. Yeah, here it is. Okay. In Genesis 1:28, uh, the Bible says, and this is supposed to be the words of God spoken to human beings, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth. Now, some people look at that and they say, told you so. The reason the climate's what it is and the reason the environment is what it is is because of Christians. They have exploited it and the more they exploit, the farther on the, well, on the road to environmental perdition we're going to be. Certainly, the contemporary consensus is that dominion is not the same as exploitation. Christians believe, and readers of the book in general believe, that God gave us the earth for our own well-being, raised crops, and the like. But that doesn't mean that he intended for us to foul our own nest. And I think that there are a number of occasions in the Bible that will, will tell us this. One is, if you look at the Jewish law in the Hebrew Scripture, 
you will find that there were all kinds of provisions made for taking care of the land, including letting the land lie fallow uh, for every seventh year, not over grazing, not over you know, leaving, leaving some of the produce of the land for the poor uh, to take care of them. Uh, moreover, there are at least two stories in the Bible, which again are sometimes taken literally and sometimes taken allegorically, but in either case suggests that human beings have a responsibility for what we would call the environment, which of course would include global warming. Um, I need to thank Susan Lyons for picking out this picture because I knew about Touchdown Jesus at Notre Dame. Uh, I did not know that there was a Touchdown Noah. <laughs> but the first, the picture that you see here is a depiction of the account in Genesis 6 of the Great Flood. And many of you know the story. God looks down on the earth. He sees great wickedness. He sees violence. Uh, he repents that he ever made humankind. He says, I'm going to wipe them all out with a flood. And then he looks down, and there is righteous Noah. And almost always in the Bible, uh, God will try to save the righteous, if he can, uh, from the unrighteous. And so he tells, he tells Noah in advance to build this ark, to prepare himself and his family. But notably, he also includes provisions for the animals. Uh, two by two, I'm sure all of you know the story, two of every unclean animal, seven of every clean animal, go to the ark, uh, stay there, and, the, and they're rescued. Uh, he works, by the way, uh, for many years, uh, apparently preaching as he goes, warning the people of the disaster to come. And like a lot of people today, they say, rain, what rain? Flood, what flood? Uh, it's probably mean, but I sometimes tell people that the first group of climate deniers are the people that you see here in the picture, the people who did not heed the warning uh, that God had given in this case and decided to go about their merry way. Now, there's another story which is a little bit more enigmatic, as we'll discuss in a moment or two, but it's the story of Joseph in the land of Egypt. Some of you may remember Joseph is a son of Jacob. Uh, he is sold by his brothers into uh, slavery, goes down to Egypt. Um, he's, he's a little bit like Dale Carnegie or some of the people that were presented in the early dime novels. Uh, you beat him down and he rises back up. He ends up in prison. Uh, he interprets a dream for somebody who gets out and forgets all about him until the Pharaoh has, these, has a series of dreams that he can interpret. And suddenly they remember Joseph, they bring him up out of prison. He warns the Pharaoh that there are going to be seven good years, which are portrayed by seven uh, fat cattle, and then there's going to be seven bad years, which are uh, symbolized by seven thin cattle. And Joseph says this means the next seven years are going to be years of plenty, the next seven years are going to be years of want, and Pharaoh says, well, what do I do about it? And somebody says, well, you know, this guy gave you the, if he's smart enough to interpret the dreams, maybe he's smart enough to tell you what to do. And the result is the Egyptians used the seven good years to prepare for uh, the seven, year, uh, seven bad years uh, that are to follow. So these suggest to me that we have the same responsibility today that we would then. If we see problems on the horizon, then we should do our best as uh, believers in the book to do so. Now, one of the particular concerns, and I don't know that it has been stressed to date very much in this lecture series, but certainly many of you are probably aware of it. It is possible for some people to be complacent about climate change because they're probably going to survive it pretty well. If you live in the middle of the country, you're not on the coast, you're not dependent on farming, so maybe it doesn't particularly care whether you have a lot of floods or a lot of heat. If you live in an air-conditioned house, you have enough money that you can sort of buy things from where you want, you will probably survive climate change, even some of the worst projections, at least, you know, at least for a generation or two. But we know 
from most studies that the people most affected and the countries most affected by climate change are often the world's poorest. They're the people on, they're the, people on the coast who don't have a lot of money in. You know, they don't live in New York City where they're talking about building a humongous barrier around the city in case of flooding. Uh, you know, people who live by rivers that are constantly flooding because of the change in climate. They're probably not people li living in the Australian bush. Uh, but we know that a major emphasis in the Bible is on God's care and concern for the downtrodden for the poor and for others. And here, by the way, is an area where Protestants and, and Catholics are often united. Uh, there's a 2004 report, so that's what, over 15 years old, by evangelicals who are often accused of sort of ignoring climate, which focuses on this very issue. It says, we need to be concerned about climate change because it's going to affect the most vulnerable. Um, Pope Francis has written an encyclical called The Care for our common home. And whether you go through, whether you're looking at the major or minor prophets in the Old Testament, Hebrew Scriptures, or whether you're looking at the Sermon on the Mount by Jesus in Matthew 5 uh, in the New Testament, you know that there is tremendous concern for those who are unable to take care of themselves. So especially to the extent that the effects of climate change are going to hurt the most vulnerable those who believe in the Bible have a particular uh, reason for action. Now, I told you that there's something that is a little bit enigmatic about the story of Joseph, and it took me many years to recognize it, and I'm not actually sure that I'm right on it, but I want to direct your attention to it because it's very interesting. Pharaoh is portrayed, or Joseph rather, is portrayed as second only to Pharaoh. He's the one who creates the storehouses, he collects the taxes from the people in, in, in the form of crops, and then he distributes it later. And in Genesis 47.20, it says that in the second seven years, when people came to him and they went out of money, he said, well, you can sell your land to the Pharaoh. Well, think of the consequence of that. Uh, you're, giving, you're giving a ruler who already sees himself as a semi-god which is something that the Bible constantly warns against, human idolatry, uh, and gives him even greater power. So one reservation that I would make that I think is common not only to Christians, but to small R Republicans, that is to people who are concerned about democratic governments in general, uh, I do think there are some solutions that you can hear to climate change uh, that would not be particularly biblical in nature. It's, it's, not, it's not an excuse to give government ultimate authority over all forms of life. We can figure out a way to do this, hopefully, with the use of democratic uh, institutions. So, I think it's common, you know, when you read your Bible or you study your Bible, the question is always, so what? So, what would the Bible have me to do? And I'm going to give you some general answers uh, perhaps you'll have some better ones than I do. First of all, I'm going to actually go to the second one. We should pursue truth. Christians should be able to look at the facts and not worry about, well, what side are the Democrats on, what side are the Republicans on, what side are the Catholics on, what side are the Muslims on. Uh, we ought to be able to use our own, <laughs> our own intellects that God has given us, we're in His image, to try to sort out things as well as we can. Secondly, if we understand that God has given us creation for our use, then I think we want to preserve it, right? Especially if, like me, you have children and grandchildren, or someday hope to. Uh, we have, you know, earlier obligations. Imagine if we lived in a society where a generation back all the farmers had decided they were tired of what they were doing and they bought, bought tons of salt and began salting the earth so they'd never have to worry about farming again. Uh, where would we be today? You know, there is a generational continuity within Scripture. A lot of emphasis on the begats uh, going, you know, thousands of years back. Uh, if they had concern for their posterity, uh, we and our Constitution, right, for ourselves and our posterity, do ordain this Constitution. 
it's something we ought to think about. We need to pray for God's wisdom. I like this. It's not in the Bible, but I think it's very biblical. Think globally, act locally. Uh, a lot of times we say, well, I can't do anything about climate change. And chances are there's not a lot I can do. Uh, I must commend my wife who takes a, a, a great care of doing recycling. It's a little thing, but it's something. Uh, most of all, I think, we need to be, to the extent that we can't control climate change, uh, we need to be trying to protect people and help people who might be victims. If we know that people are starving because uh, crops have changed, then we need to aid. If people are in flood, uh, in, in danger of floods, we need to help them. And then I'm going to add something that I haven't added to this, but I think it's particularly appropriate to a group of honor students. Now, most of us are thinking, if you're an honor student, of a vocation. You're thinking, it's, we ask kids from three or four up, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to do? And sometimes in Christian circles, and this is probably true of other religious circles as well, people say, well, the highest calling is to be a preacher or a priest or a rabbi or an imam. Or the only way you can serve God is to be a missionary. Or if you can't do that, be a youth leader or a choir director or whatever. And I'm not putting down any of these things. I think these are noble callings to have. But I think the Christian view of creation is God has created each of us uniquely with our own talents and our own desires. And we should seek to treat our vocation as an avocation. Uh, that's been my approach to life. Uh, it's far easier to come to work thinking, I'm doing God's will. I am doing, I am exercising the talents that God gave me than it is to say, <clears throat> got another day of work, uh, got to save for retirement, uh, and the like. So, you know, there's a, a term <clears throat> was particularly common, I think, among the Puritans, but it's the notion of a holy calling. And it's the notion that as individuals, you know, our purpose in life is not so much to seek our own happiness, pursuit of happiness, as Mr. Jefferson would say, but it's the notion of serving God through serving others. And I fully believe that a call to be a geologist or a physicist or a chemist, or a <clears throat> climatologist, I believe they are just as consistent with the biblical mandate as some of these more spiritual callings than we often think about. So at this point, I'm going to, and hopefully we can leave this up just a few minutes for those who are at home and can't, can't come up and ask me directly about this, but you'll see at the very top, <coughs> I have included most of the scriptures that I've used today. If you want to uh, look them up, I have typically quoted from the King James just because it's the most notable version, uh, but there are certainly other versions that you could use that would say pretty much the same thing. And then I've given you a list of other uh, books out of there. One of the more interesting is this Green Bible, uh, which is actually a Bible translation, uh, which includes uh, some essays on, on, on environmental issues. Um, a number of others that are there as well. But I want to end on a personal note. Uh, I'm not actually sure when most of you are going to see this. I know that we are now in our second week of spring break and that there are very few students on campus. Most of you don't have a lot of direct contact with us. But I want to assure you this is one of our attempts to try to be able to finish out the semester in a course for you. And I want to assure you that if you have problems you are free to check with us. Uh, I've given my email there earlier, john.vial at mtsu.edu. If, you have trouble, you know, if you have questions about this lecture, one of the sad things about doing it the way I'm doing it today is I love questions. Uh, I'm sure I probably said something that's incorrect or incomplete, and I'm sure that many of you probably have some ideas of your own of maybe pr biblical principles that I have not failed to omit or little qualifications that you would put in. I more than welcome uh, your comments on this. I do hope all of you are safe and well. And again, if you need help, 
let me just say I'm, I'm a member of a group on campus of uh, people of faith, uh, and I know that one of our concerns over the last week or two has been what can we do to help students who are away from campus or who are on campus and whatever. I just urge you, you know, it's, it's important to keep your distance from people who might be affected, but I would really urge you not to be socially isolated from one another. I encourage you to call, use email, use other means of communication. If you're having trouble, let us know. We know it's a rough time. I was thinking you know, in my life, this is the first time I've ever been through something quite like this. And one of the interesting things is, and maybe I'll leave on this, one of the books that I wrote within the last year or so is a book about Benjamin Rush. He was an early American founder. He was a, a medical doctor, one of the few who signed the Declaration of Independence. And one of the fascinating things about Rush was and his methods were primitive, and some people think he did as much harm as he did good. But here was a man who stayed through not one, but a number of yellow fever epidemics in Philadelphia. He lost a sister during this, and he would work 12 to 15, 18 hours a day trying to minister to people. Um, and so what we have right now is not completely new, and it's, 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 it tells, you know, Rush sort of underlines for me this notion of vocation. You know, some of you are going to be doctors and nurses. Some of you are going to be scientists. You're going to be serving God, in my view, as you serve other human beings. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I hope all of you are well.